thank you everyone for joining us today. Our webinar, uh, Liquid Natural Gas Explained, the Why Loosing to Gibbs Down Story, is going to be a collaboration between the Sierra Club Pennsylvania chapter of Protect Northern PA, the Delaware River Keeper Network, and Penn Future. Um, our presenters today, if you could advance Kelsey. Our presenters today are Abby Jones, Tracy Carluccio, uh, Kelsey Kreps, and Diana, Diana Dakey. Um, I'm going to give you a little bit of a blurby intro for all of our wonderful speakers so that you can uh, learn a little bit more about them. Um, we'll start out in reverse order of the way that our presenters are going to go today um, with Abby Jones. So Abby is Vice President of Legal and Policy at Penn Future. As Vice President, Abby is responsible for integrating Penn Future's legal, regulatory, and policy activities in furtherance of the organization's mission of protecting Pennsylvania's air, water, and land, and empowering citizens to build sustainable communities for future generations. In her role as an attorney based out of Penn Future's Mount Pocono office, her work focuses on water quality and watershed protection, special protections, waters, and stormwater management. Abby also works on the issues related to the petrochemical and fracking industries that threaten the health of Pennsylvania's people and environment. Tracy Carluccio is Deputy Director of the Delaware Riverkeeper Network, where she's been employed as an environmental advocate since 1989, working throughout the Delaware River watershed in New Jersey, Pennsylvania, New York, and Delaware. Delaware Riverkeeper Network is a nonprofit membership organization working throughout the entire length of the breadth and breadth of the Delaware River watershed, speaking and working for both its protection and its restoration. Um, Diana Dakey is a concerned resident of Lackawanna County and is founding as a founding member of the watchdog group Protect Northern PA, which was created to battle the LNG facility being built in Bradford County, Pennsylvania. She served as a board member and active volunteer for environmental and uh, good government groups and believes that positive change is possible when people step up. And Kelsey Kreps is a senior campaign representative for the Sierra Club Beyond Dirty Fuels campaign based out of Western Pennsylvania. Born and raised in Northwestern PA, Kelsey works to challenge gas pipelines and petrochemical infrastructure in her home state. Her past experience includes clean air, clean water, and petrochemical work at Penn Future. Kelsey holds a double master's from Appalachian State University in Renewable Technology and Appalachian Studies. So with that in mind, uh, I'm going to turn it over to Kelsey to uh, start the discussion on what exactly LNG is, how it's produced, and some of its negative impacts. Take it away, Kelsey. Thanks, Sarah. All right. Like Sarah said, I'm going to kind of be giving a good overview of some of the stuff with LNG today before kicking it over to the rest of the really great panelists we have here today. Um, first up, I really wanted to just talk about liquefi um, liquefied natural gas and how, what it stands for. And so LNG and what it stands for, and it stands for liquefied natural gas. Sorry, it's been a, it's been a day. Um, liquefied natural gas is actually fracked gas that's been cooled to negative 162 degrees Celsius or negative 260 degrees Fahrenheit. And this is done through a similar process um, as our refrigeration systems in our homes are. It's used, um, it's liquefaction and, and this is used through main cryogenic heat exchangers like this really large one here underneath the liquefaction. Um, and this, like I said before, is really similar to the refrigeration process that's in your own homes. Once the fracked gas is cooled, it can, it is one six hundredth of its normal size. And so this is why it's gone through this process to then make it easier for storage and export, um, where it can then be regasified for its end use product. So this might be a power plant or this might be for um, domestic folks using um, industrial processes. Um, I have here just this really broad overview photo. We're gonna be talking about a couple of these proposed facilities in the state of Pennsylvania. And I really wanted to show an overview 
of just how this is all connected today. So up here in Wyalusing, we have the proposed liquefaction facility for making LNG. Um, and then it would be transported via truck and train all the way down to Gibbstown, New Jersey at, to an export terminal. And that's really just giving you a quick little overview visually to show kind of the connections that we're hoping to make today to talk about LNG and the problems that are associated with it. The biggest, um, big, big, big issue is that LNG in and of itself means more fracking. And in the state of Pennsylvania, there are a lot of issues with fracking that we already have and have had for quite a long time as long as we've been producing. Um, the waste of fracking is um, full of different chemicals that are not disclosed to the public. It is hard to dispose of. There are lots of health and safety problems associated with fracking from harmful emissions to wastewater, um, uh, to groundwater contamination and water contamination in general. Um, this can he cause really harmful health effects as many of us were probably potentially familiar with the Pennsylvania grand jury investigation report that was released over the summer. Um, you can get anything from skin lesions to rashes. It can cause sleep deprivation, being close to fracking wells. Um, it can be causing anxiety or depression. It can be linked to rare cancers. There are a lot of health and safety problems related to fracking. It's also a major land disturbance um, and also involves um, radioactivity and the harmful emissions are also a respiratory uh, in a respiratory uh, irritant as well. So in and of itself, the one facility that we're talking about today is the export terminal and it's going to mean more fracking in the state of Pennsylvania. The other big implication with LNG here, especially the way that's happening um, in this particular instance, is that LNG is highly flammable and in inextinguishable. So once this, uh, the liquid has actually met the air and been ignited in some way, shape or form, you cannot put it out until it is all burned. This is where the, the really, the nickname bomb trains has come from when it comes to transporting LNG because it's extremely dangerous and also the traveling along this long rope that we've been talking about or we'll talk about more in detail includes um, making sure that folks are um, evacuated within a mile radius of those routes. So that's a lot of ground to cover. And also within the route that we'll talk about later, it's going to go through a lot of dense populations of people in um, some of the areas outside of Philadelphia. And these are very much so environmental justice communities, and there's a lot of folks that will be directly impacted by any potential harms or hazards that could occur with one of these um, LNG trucks or trains um, igniting in any way, shape, or form. One of the other implications of LNG is that um, the harmful emissions that come from fracking, as well as the processing of fracked gas, the processing of or underground storage, any pipelines associated with this work, all of these end uses, which I know are kind of small to see in this particular photo, but power plants, liquid natural gas um, facilities, when you're going to actually use the LNG, all of these emit methane and methane leaks at every end use of the of this process. It also has in, incredible implications for our global warming potential. And in a 20 year period has 87 times the impact of carbon dioxide. It's an extremely, um, it, it traps heat extremely well um, compared to even CO2. And as you can see, there are a lot of problems with LNG, but I'm gonna turn it over to Diana to talk about one of the particular facilities that we're concerned about within this presentation.
Diana, we're not able to, I'm not able to hear you right this moment. Are you unmuted? Great, okay, um, can you hear me? Um, thank you, Sarah and the Sierra Club for hosting this program. So I'm gonna tell you about the uh, Bradford County end of this LNG project, that's, uh, this project that spans two states and uh, goes on to uh, international impacts from there. So in the second half of 2019, news slowly trickled out that a liquefied natural gas plant had been um, permitted by DEP and had um, received conditional uses from the from Wyalusing Township in Bradford County. And so local people in um, uh, late 2019, near where the project was gonna be built, um, had um, a, a gathering there on the grounds to call attention to it. And then in uh, March of this year, a committee was formed and met um, in Wyalusing. Uh, and, you know, after COVID, of course, we've been meeting virtually. So I was uh, informally appointed as the facilitator to make those uh, regular meetings uh, happen. And we've continued to explore the issues surrounding the now under construction uh, LNG plant in Wyalusing Township. Um, after we had take, uh, taken a deep dive into the issues, we put up a website, uh, protectnorthernpa.org, um, that was in the, the previous slide. Um, please uh, check us out. And um, by the way, all the artwork on our website is from Brian Keeler, a well-known artist uh, who's originally from the Wyalusing area and um, feels uh, passionate about preserving its beauty and history. So we can go on to the map now. Um, so uh, let's look at the footprint of this project. Uh, so the company, New Fortress Energy, uh, through a local subsidiary, Bradford County Real Estate Partners, has commenced construction on some 200 plus acres along the Susquehanna River. You see it there between Route 6 uh, and the Susquehanna River. You know, this has been a popular uh, recreational and ca uh, canoeing spot. And then in the next slide, um, you'll see that uh, valuable historic resources are being lost. Um, Brown Town, that's the unincorporated village in Wyalusing Township, was the site of the Friedenschutten settlement of the Moravians in the Susquehannocks in the uh, 1700s. So I'm showing you the historical marker, uh, and then there's a monument there, and then in that uh, bottom picture, um, you can kind of see this access road uh, with it uh, being with the construction debris there and that monument in the corner. So um, in the next slide, you can see an aerial view of this uh, project. Um, and um, thank, we can uh, move on to the, the next one. Um, so this is what, the, what it looks like now. Um, they've completed most of the earth moving. Uh, thank you, uh, Frack Tracker Alliance, for um, sending up a drone to take this picture for us. Um, so the company has not yet brought in those, um, the LNG equipment, those long tubes called uh, LNG trains, uh, but they say they'll resume construction in 20, uh, 2021. So why, why this plant in this location? Um, the, you know, the scheme is unique in that LNG is being made inland and will be transported overland by tanker truck or rail to an ocean port. Uh, in this case, Gibbstown, New Jersey, along the Delaware River. So this is a um, novel um, business scheme. Uh, the typical model for uh, LNG for export is to make it in the coastal areas uh, where um, the, the gas comes in um, from a um, connection to an interstate pipeline. So in the next slide, uh, let's, let's focus on the uh, large volumes. Um, uh, let's see. Um, I think we're, we have a slide out of order maybe, I don't know, did I? <laughs> um, the, um, that, that's okay. Uh, yeah, th there we go, thank you, thank you. Um, great, so um, the, um, this, the wide area impacts are that um, this uh, three and a half to four million gallons per day is gonna fill um, 350 tanker trucks or 100 rail cars. And uh, just think of, think about the, the volumes there. Um, 350 tanker trucks, now that's, uh, even the company says that's 15 filled, um, you know, going and then coming back. And, you know, by my, um, by, by anybody's simple math, so that's like 
uh, one every two minutes. Now I'm trying to picture that going through uh, the business district uh, in Clark Summit uh, near where I live. Um, and you know what happens to the sidewalk ambiance in the business district? People in crosswalks, um, people trying to parallel park. I, I'm just trying to fathom that. Um, so in the in the next um, slide, um, uh, you know you'll see the we can go on to the yeah here we go. Um, there's also um, you know the possibility of rail transport, and um, what you're looking at here is a busy intersection in Tunkhannock where you have an at-grade railroad crossing. Um, you have this uh, very old railroad bridge and um, uh, it's hard to imagine a 100 car unit train going uh, down um, uh, you know, these types of tracks. Uh, so in, in the next slide, um, the, uh, uh, the, here's a, you know, just a map of, of um, uh, eastern half of Pennsylvania. And you, you know you can see how the, the route is going to impact multiple counties as it leaves, as the LNG leaves Bradford County, makes its way down through the Philadelphia area and on over into New Jersey. The reason I'm, I'm you know showing you this here is because um, in Pennsylvania, you know there, there's no um, uh, 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 fracked gas uh, impact uh, uh, you know, tax, um, but there is an impact fee, uh, but that only goes to the gas extracting counties. And so counties with no extraction, but but who are on this whole route are getting zero dollars. Uh, and, uh, you know, this is a point that has been um, uh, pointed out regularly in the press in um, uh, like the Times Tribune and other press in our area that, um, you know, our communities are being put at risk by this project and, but we're not getting anything back uh, for these impacts of the gas industry. So in the next slide, um, the, you know, could this happen to your community? Well, it, it most certainly could um, because, um, you know, this is a, a new concept and um, I, there might be other large export projects that the industry would like to set up in <laughs> Pennsylvania with impacts to be um, borne by your community. And so um, why, why, you know, why would your community like, like, like ours find themselves victimized by this? Well, on the next slide, um, uh, we can just see a little snippet of the Pennsylvania municipalities planning code. So over in Wyalusing Township, um, they gave the, um, the uh, project developers two conditional use um, permits. And um, under the uh, P uh, Pennsylvania Municipalities Planning Code, um, one municipality has no obligation to tell others of zoning changes it's, it makes. And, um, you know, with all of the um, uh, municipalities in Pennsylvania, um, you know, operating independently, um, there's, you know, not a way that um, people in, um, say, uh, Lehigh County who are um, along the um, purported rail route would hear about this. And then in the uh, next slide, um, I'm also um, showing you the Act 14 uh, notice requirements. So when a developer um, wants to um, put up a gas processing plant or some other kind of um, uh, project in Pennsylvania, they um, are required um, by this Act 14 to send this notice to the host municipality and also send a copy to the county. Um, but these um, notices are only going to the host municipality. Um, there is no way that anybody else in, um, uh, you know, this was in Bradford County, so there's no, no way anybody else, say over in Lackawanna County, knew that, that uh, this was going on. Now, in the next slide, um, I'll, um, I'm showing you, um, uh, this is just a uh, radius uh, around um, the LNG facility. And what you're looking at here is, um, uh, and this is a map uh, Frack Tracker did for us showing um, well pads, um, boreholes, fracking waste disposal, uh, et cetera. And um, as Kelsey was saying, you know, there's a, a huge footprint here. But um, when DEP awarded a permit, uh, or, or when it awards any permit for a gas processing plant, they're only looking at that 
plant right there in the middle of that drawing. Um, they are not looking at the wide area impacts from all the associated fracking, um, which um, includes the um, clearing of well pads, the, um, the well bore holes, the bringing in of sand, the drawing of water from the Susquehanna River, the um, uh, gathering lines, um, which are feeding into pipelines, uh, and compressor, compressor, compression, compression stations, excuse me, used to move that gas along. Um, these things are, are not considered um, in the permitting of a gas processing plant, which only looks at that uh, bullseye right there in the middle um, and um, doesn't look beyond the fence line. So in the next slide, um, you know, uh, at, at Protect Northern PA, we, we um, uh, wanted to find out, well, how would the ordinary person find out? Um, you know, one, a person can subscribe to these e-notices from DEP, and um, uh, this is what one of them looks like. Um, however, th this is also very cryptic, and um, you'll see, um, you know, you can subscribe to these, and you get this list of um, DEPs. Basically, it's what DEP worked on in a particular day, and uh, then you can click on the link and see uh, whether they've done a completeness review or some other step in their review. But these notices also, uh, again, do not allow you to connect the dots on a project um, which uh, has um, so many wide area impacts. And then in the, in the next slide, an, another example of wide area impacts, and this is what um, Kelsey was talking about, um, so in the applic uh, application, um, the applicant did dis uh, disclose to DEP and expected approximately 1 million tons per year of greenhouse gases. And, um, you know, DEP requires that the applicant report what they estimate that these are going to be, but DEP doesn't require any mitigation of these greenhouse gases. And, you know, with the segmented approach to permitting, um, you know, nobody assessed the greenhouse gases from the additional drilling and gathering or the boil off during transportation uh, or the um, ship loading worldwide transport or ultimate uh, end use uh, overseas of this uh, LNG. And um, I also have to, you know, say here, um, you know, in Pennsylvania, we're making this effort to reduce our greenhouse gas footprint with, with uh, for example, the regional greenhouse gas uh, an initiative also known as REGI. Uh, but, um, uh, it, uh, you know, uh, here we are exporting um, greenhouse gases in the form of LNG. The, the exportation of, of LNG is somewhat of a safety net for the fracked gas industry right now, which has overproduced and thereby um, produced well beyond the domestic needs for gas. And um, as a result, they um, are exporting in order to bring up the, uh, the price on their um, uh, on their product. So in in my um, uh, next slide, uh, again, um, I, I would just encourage you to go to our website, and um, I'll just and we can go on to my last slide. Um, uh, please, uh, oh maybe that was my last slide. Sorry. Uh, you can just uh, join uh, join us and. Um, uh, you know, we occasionally send out an action alert and uh, you can help us uh, find both find out what's going on and um, stop some of these dangerous projects. So uh, thank you very much. And I'll turn the program over to Tracy. Thank you, Diana. And welcome, uh, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for taking time out of your afternoon to join us. And thank you to Sierra Club for sponsoring this uh, forum today. Uh, so at the first slide is a picture of the, the location of the Gibbstown Logistics Center. And New Fortress Energy's LNG export proposal hinges on this, on the Gibbstown terminal, where the liquefied natural gas would be delivered from Pennsylvania and then shipped um, overseas from a proposed dock that they'd like to build on the Delaware River. It's called Dock 2. And Dock 2 would be added to the existing Gibbstown Logistics Center, which has one dock and is not yet operating. Uh, the Deepwater Port 
uh, was supposed to originally have one dock and one ship and primarily handle dry goods and um, perishables like fruit and vegetables and some natural gas liquids. We did oppose it back then as we did not feel another terminal was necessary. There were terminals in the area looking for customers, uh, but we did not, uh, were not able to stop that. It moved ahead in 2017. But in a classic bait and switch, the applicants, Delaware River Partners, a subsidiary of New Fortress Energy, the same company that owns the Raya Lusing uh, subsidiary, uh, wants to add a second dock with two more shipping berths, and that potentially will triple the activity there. Um, and the handling of liquefied natural gas and natural gas liquids at this terminal is one of the most concerning aspects of the operations uh, that would occur there. Um, as the trucks and the trains that Diana talked about arrive at the terminal, the LNG would be directly loaded uh, from those containers through pipes into waiting ships around the clock. That's 365 days a year, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And this is the first and the only liquefied natural gas project of this scale in the entire nation that would not provide any storage or use a pipeline, but would perpetually transload from container to ship. Now, one of the most dangerous activities in the handling of liquefied natural gas, according to the industry, is, trans is the transloading process. So, um, and that's that's due mainly to the potential for an accident or um, a uh, you know a decoupling to occur, some sort of spill, human error. Um, so, the large terminals operating today minimize this part of the handling. Uh, it will take about two weeks for one of these ships in Gibbstown to be filled in this dribs and drabs process, um, you know, perpetual process. And at a big facility, um, it takes one day at one of these other facilities where the terminal is located right at the liquefaction plant. So this is the difference here. Uh, this is basically, um, uh, we're still back at the, other, at the original one. I, I haven't gotten off that yet. Um, so this is basically going to be an experiment. And it's never been done this way before uh, in, in the United States. And just like the overland transport, it's um, using about 1.3 million people along the rail and truck routes as guinea pigs. And the way we look at it, they're sort of writing that off as a sacrifice zone. So this is the location of the terminal. It's about uh, 2.7 miles from Chester, which you can see right uh, south of there. It's about 1.9 miles from the Philadelphia airport. Uh, just upriver there, and it's about a 15-minute drive from Philadelphia. You can see that up upriver, uh, just a little ways there. Um, it, it's in basically a, a highly populated area. Um, it's also up against, and next slide, please, uh, up against the backyards of the people of Gibbstown. Uh, for instance, there's a daycare center at the entrance, and there's homes and businesses like these homes here, and schools, uh, play yards, all within a mile. Um, and, and that's you know part of the problem here is that um, the federal government recommends what they call remote siting for these types of terminals. And that's due to the potential impact of catastrophic and human loss and also structural damage should there be a release of liquefied natural gas. But that's not what this site is. This site couldn't be more poorly picked in terms of um, its proximity to populations and to sensitive ecological resources. Uh, for instance, the state of Delaware final environmental impact statement that was done for their coastal zone management plan, um, they cite a report that says up to six miles could be affected by a release of liquefied natural gas. And that's because the, the cold vapor cloud moves and it's also because it can explode and cause the fire that Kelsey talked about earlier, uh, up to six miles can be impacted. Next slide, please. So what would happen at Gibbstown is as the uh, ships would leave where you see that star there, uh, it, by the way, it's a, you see DuPont written there, uh, it's a former DuPont munitions manufacturing site. It, they manufactured munitions there for over 100 years. It's highly polluted. We're very opposed to the project because of the stirring up of the pollutants that are known to be at that site, which include um, nitrobenzene, aniline, and PCBs. It's one of the highest um, contributors of PCBs to the entire Delaware estuary. We're very concerned about the construction and stirring up during the operation of this site uh, by this project. 
uh, is one of our um, reasons that we are appealing uh, the three major permits for this project. Um, but as these, as the ships uh, would leave the site, they would travel downstream there, and you can see, uh, you know, the, would go right past Chester, um, and go right then south onto the next slide. And um, as it moves down through the Delaware River and Bay, it passes Wilmington, uh, a, a very, um, you know, dense, uh, densely populated community. Both Chester and Wilmington are uh, designated and known to be environmental justice communities because of the uh, disproportionate environmental impacts of already existing pollution releases there. Um, and then it would move down the Delaware uh, Bay through, through the estuary past um, the Bayshore, uh, Delaware, and New Jersey, South Jersey communities, and then out and within about a mile or two of Lewes, Delaware, as it goes out to sea, where it will go to overseas ports. And one of the important things um, about this project is that the New Fortress Energy is not just in this um, as a terminal uh, builder or as a liquefaction plant builder. Um, it's also in it as an import terminal builder. And they're overseas, for instance, in Puerto Rico and Ireland, trying to force import terminals to be built to accept this gas from Gibbstown in Pennsylvania. And there are people there, organizations there, and now even the Irish government opposing the import of the gas from this facility and other liquefied natural gas producing facilities because they want to turn towards renewables. That's the trend of the future. It's the trend for now in terms of uh, the actions that we need to take as both Kelsey and Diana uh, mentioned because of the greenhouse gas emissions and our need to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions uh, by at least 45% by 2035, according to um, uh, international scientists. So as it would move now, um, so, so there's fights going on overseas where they wanna send, send this stuff. Uh, and then on the next slide, I just you know, wanna depict, uh, so you can see these enormous ships um, with uh, potentially explosive payloads uh, that would be, you know, moving down um, a very far distance to the sea. Most of the terminals are located right on the coast and go right out to the open sea, so they don't have this treacherous pathway um, that passes so many populated air, landed areas. Um, and this is one of the reasons why the state of Delaware actually bans liquefied natural gas terminals in their coastal zone, because they don't want it to be in proximity to populations. Next slide, please. So um, this is an interactive map. Um, it is available on Delaware Riverkeeper Network's website. We commissioned it from Frack Tracker, who did a terrific job in uh, helping us uh, plug in the census information here. And this map, when you go there, you can zoom down to actually neighborhoods right within, like you see there, Allentown, um, Reading, uh, Philadelphia, Trenton, and you can go right down to the street level and see who lives there and and what what is what resources are there that could pen, potentially uh, be impacted. Um, and you know when there's a two mile high hazard zone area, which is sort of that colored area that you see along the purple line, which is the the route of um, in this case the the train route. And that's the area that would be um, most uh, severely impacted the quickest should there be, uh, for instance, a train derailment and a release of LNG. Um, but those bubbles that you see there, those are schools and childcare centers. So it, these are the kinds of um, uh, sensitive populations that are right along the, this train route. And it's the same, next slide, please. Um, and it's the same along uh, all the, the potential routes. Now, I'm quickly just going to show you, not spend a lot of time on this because it's too much to read, but these are the two most likely rail routes. We don't know the exact routes, and I wanted to, to point that out because we had to use um, hazmat specialists. We went to unions. We went to uh, transportation um, agencies and, and union, uh, unions that work for uh, for instance, the railways, in order to figure out what is the most likely route going to be. Now, we know for the rail routes that their special permit only allows them to go directly from Wyalusing to Gibbstown with no stops or diversions. But the exact route, according to uh, the Pipeline and Hazardous Materials Safety Administration, where we filed a Freedom of Information Act request in order to find out what it is, according to them, um, they don't know. 
and the reason that they say they don't know is because actually this is protected information is considered to be protected under homeland security and you can't actually get that uh that exact route but this is uh, uh, with all the experts that we consulted and using for instance the railway atlas and the highway administration information this is the route that we expect the rail routes to go and next slide please um, the next one shows where we would expect the truck routes to go. It basically would go down um, through the um, back roads up closest to Wyalusing and then move down and end up on 476, the blue route, and then either go around uh, Philadelphia to the north or go a little bit to the south and then go right through Chester and go over the Commodore Berry Bridge and into Gibbstown. Uh, one thing I wanna say here that Diana touched on is that there are communities fighting this. Uh, we, our organizations, including Protect Northern PA, who's been very active in our resolution um, campaign, has been going to communities along the route and explaining what's coming down the road or down the tracks, literally, that they don't know about. And, you know, I, I, it, uh, it does not, we're not exaggerating when we say nobody knows about this. These communities had no idea, and they're not going to be notified until perhaps there would be some sort of training that's required under the special permit for the trains, for instance, but not required uh, for highway transport um, to have some first responder and fireman training. I understand from speaking with experts that usually takes about four or five hours. It's not a big deal. Um, it's not certainly adequate in order to really prepare communities because as uh, was mentioned by Diana, um, you know, the, the fireman's guidebook about how to first responders and firemen's guidebook that's put out by the U.S. Department of Transportation says basically evacuate and move back. You can't do anything if there's a release. You can't put the fire out. You can't stop the explosion. So we know that people would die should it happen, for instance, going as it goes through a, a populated community. The special permit, uh, next slide, please. Um, oh, and for the resolutions, we have 14 of them passed. 14 communities uh, have passed these resolutions and 10 of them are in Pennsylvania. Um, thank you, especially to Protect Northern PA and Brooks Gas Truth, um, who worked very hard on getting those passed, as well as some communities in Bucks County um, where uh, local organizations made that happen. Um, they're still being worked on in New Jersey in Delaware as well, and we have some that have been passed there. Um, so I just want to show here in this um, blown up uh, vision of the interaction uh, interactive map that as it goes through Philadelphia and crosses uh, the river on the Delaware Bridge and then goes down through Camden down to Gimstown where you see that ship, um, it passes through mainly black and brown people's communities, low income communities, and this is definitely an, an environmental injustice that is absolutely intolerable. And one of the things about the special rail permit that has us so concerned is that these um, rail cars that are going to be used were designed 50 years ago. Um, they have been used for other products, but they've never been used for uh, liquefied natural gas. They've never been tested for liquefied natural gas. And as a matter of fact, the federal government had recently approved not only this special permit, which was rushed through by the Trump administration for New Fortress Energy subsidiary, but the federal government also responding to an executive order by President Trump issued a rulemaking which would allow liquefied natural gas to be carried in rail cars across the United States on any um, rail, railway um, that can accept this type of freight by any carrier. And when they, um, this is, has alarmed states to such a degree that 14 states have joined together to legally challenge this new rule, including Pennsylvania's attorney general. Um, and when they pass that rule because of input that they received from te uh, technical experts, they did require for that new federal rule, an extra strong steel jacket be put on the outside of these inadequate or basically substandard old fashioned rail cars that they're gonna be using. But the permit that allows the new Fortress Energy subsidiary to move the gas from Wyalusing to Gibbstown does not even have to put that extra steel a strong steel jacket on the outside of the cars. They get to use the super old fashioned substandard ones without any changes at all. Talk about being a sacrifice zone. It's really outrageous. Um, so the agencies like the, uh, the, the National Transportation Safety Board and the National Firefighters Association all oppose the federal rulemaking and perhaps with the new Biden 
administration, this can be overturned. There is a movement in Congress as well to overturn it, uh, but the votes obviously are not there yet. Um, so they don't even know enough about how uh, liquefied natural gas derailment would affect people in places um, where it would go through. So this really does make us make us all into guinea pigs and is very, very concerning. So next slide, please. So um, the, the one thing, uh, you, you already covered the greenhouse gas emissions, just want to point out that uh, on the 20 year time scale, uh, greenhouse gas of methane is actually 86 times more powerful than carbon. So this is the period of time over the next 20 years when, when we have to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions if we're going to get any handle at all on, on the climate crisis. So now moving to the last slide, um, just I want to point out how important this week is to our fight against this entire project, the project that goes all the way from the gas fields in uh, the Marcellus Shale to Wyalusing, all the way through these transportation corridors down to Gibstown. Because if we can stop the Gibstown terminal, then it really sets New Fortress Energy back in terms of being able to carry out their scheme. And this week, we are, have a week of action. And today is the fourth day of that week of action. And you can join in through social media today and by signing a petition also. And that's on the, New For, uh, the Nor Protect Northern PA website and on Delaware Riverkeeper Network's website. And perhaps in the, in the chat, um, we, can, we can put those links to the petition as well. But today is Instagram day, for instance. We use Twitter's, uh, Twitter day on, was on Tuesday. And what we're doing is we're sending messages to the four governors who are going to vote at the Delaware River Basin Commission next week, at least they're expected to vote, on Wednesday, December 9th, 10.30 a.m. At that meeting, they are going to perhaps make their decision about whether or not to allow the penultimate permit that they must need, they, they, they have to get, they need it or they cannot move ahead in order to be able to commence construction of the project. So it's on hold right now. This this, pro, this Dock 2 project uh, has been given a stay by the Delaware River Basin Commission while the commissioners take a deep dive into the material uh, that was produced through Delaware Riverkeeper Network's appeal of the permit that was given originally last year by Delaware River Basin Commission. But December 9th is the target and the governors who are going to be voting along with the Army Corps of Engineers as the fifth voting member of the commission are going to be considering all of the information that was produced by that, that litigation, but also we'll be hearing from the public and we want them to go into that meeting with the public's opposition ringing in their ears and understand that people think that this project should be stopped and they should not approve uh, the uh, Dock 2, which would be the approval for liquefied natural gas to be exported from the facility. So um, if you want to join in, it's not too late, but we welcome as many people as possible. As a matter of fact, the more people that take part, the louder we'll be, and the more clear will be our message to the governors of the four states and the Army Corps, although they're not likely to go with us until the administration changes, um, to vote no on the Gibstown Export Terminal Dock 2. So at this time, I'd like to turn it over to, to Abby, and Abby Jones from Penn Future is gonna take on the next leg of our discussion today. Thank you, Abby. Thanks, Tracy, um, I appreciate it. Um, do you wanna go to the next slide? So as we've been hearing from Diana and Tracy, um, there are just, piecemeal regulations of LNG, if there's any regulation at all, right? So there are various federal and state regulations that cover bits and pieces maybe of this, um, but there's no clear statute or law that comprehensively regulates LNG in the US. Um, and so here's a list of some of the main players um, that we're looking at. We have FERC, who regulates oil and gas in the United States. Pipeline Hazards Materials and Safety Administration called PIMSA. There's other federal agencies that need to um, issue permits. Um, state environmental agencies, we've heard Tracy and Diana both talk about PA uh, DEP and the New Jersey DEP. And then in some respect, like Diana mentioned, uh, municipalities can get involved. Next slide, please. And that's because there are so many different environmental impacts and community impacts um, that are associated with the, the manufacturing, 
transport and exportation of LNG in the United States. And this is just a, a very high level overview of some of those impacts and some of the applicable laws that we um, here are looking at exploring ways to um, um, stop uh, these facilities from getting their permits, to ensure that um, additional protections if they do get the permits are in place to protect our air, our land, our water, and our people. Uh, next slide, please. So now Diana and Tracy both talk, talked about um, the ways that their groups are being involved and other groups are being involved. And I'm just gonna run through very quickly some of the high level, um, big picture um, ways that we are getting involved. So if we're looking at the Wyalusing facility, we're looking at protecting Pennsylvania's resources and we're looking at Pennsylvania DEP. There is no, um, in Pennsylvania, uh, comprehensive or cumulative impact analysis at the state level. Um, the PADP is responsible for issuing permits like air quality plan approvals, um, water encroachment permits, water discharge and withdrawal permits. Um, so there are various programs of DEP that may be issuing permits, but those, as I think Diana mentioned, those programs aren't talking to each other. There's no comprehensive review. It's limited only to the facility. Um, we're not looking at the transport, for example, like Tracy mentioned. And there are certain issues, um, a majority of those are safety issues that are federally preempted from the state even regulating those. So um, as far as the Wyalusing facility is concerned, we are working as hard as we can um, to work uh, in the DP sphere. Next slide, please. And then when we're looking at the Gibstown facility, as Tracy went through very nicely, uh, we're looking at protecting the Delaware and the communities along the Delaware. Um, so Tracy mentioned the DRB um, C docket, that's another word for their permit. Um, for the DOC2 project, it was approved in June 2019. And since then, DRN has been engaged in an aggressive legal battle, battle to rescind that approval. And this spring and summer, they, um, they were part of an adjudicatory hearing where they presented evidence, um, expert evidence uh, and legal argument against approval of the permit for the DOC2 project. And their arguments uh, were many and they were great. I, I encourage you if you can to, to review it, but they're basically saying that DRBC did not give a full and fair review of this permit and cut out a lot of um, um, evidence and argument and public input. And that the project at its base will result in significant harm to water quality, aquatic habits and aquatic organisms, including protected sturgeon species. Next slide, please. And as I mentioned, there's no really state uh, comprehensive review. So we look to FERC then, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, to kind of give us that comprehensive and connected review. Um, the FERC needs to apply a NEPA analysis, the National Environmental Policy Review Act that looks at all different kinds of um, environmental impacts, if they're significant, looks at cumulative impacts, it looks at community impacts. And in September of this year, both the um, Bradford County Real Estate Partners and the Delaware River um, Partners um, filed independent motions asking FERC to declare that the wild losing and Gibson facilities do not meet the requirements of FERC jurisdiction. So these facilities are asking for there to be no federal review of these facilities. And in that case, Penn Future, Sierra Club, DRN, and Protect Northern, Re uh, P Protect Northern PA, my apologies, and others filed protests and motions to intervene in these proceedings, arguing that these facilities independently require FERC jurisdiction and review. And as Tracy and Diana both alluded to and, and, and explained, this is a logistically and financially connected LNG project. New Fortress Energy through various subsidiaries and, and uh, funding mechanisms basically controls the whole process cradle to grave, right? They're making and manufacturing the LNG in Wyalusing. They are responsible for transporting it down to Gibstown and they are responsible for exporting it overseas. So this is one big project. FERC needs to do the analysis on that. And we believe that if that's the case, then this just won't pass muster. There are too many environmental and community impacts to allow this to go through. Next slide, please. Finally, the bomb trains, right? Kelsey mentioned this um, and, and we've been kind of talking about the, the transport issues, but in January, this year, the Trump administration changed the rules. Um, prior to this, um, 
LNG could not be transported by rail because it was just simply too dangerous. Um, now they're looking uh, to be transported by untested rail tanker cars. And as we know from crude oil, the DOT, I think it's 113 uh, tank trains just are not safe to transport this kind of um, material. And that's what the uh, LNG tank cars are gonna be based off of. So in August of this year, states, 14 states and a number of environmental organizations filed separate federal lawsuits um, to stop this rule change that would allow for bomb trains um, to be, to be um, authorized. Uh, Pennsylvania, thankfully, New Jersey, thankfully, Delaware, thankfully, were part of those states. And I thank Sierra Club, DRN, and others for bringing that suit as well. Next slide, please. So brief overview of kind of what we are doing and what we see our avenues to be. We can talk about this more um, offline if you want, but please join our fight, right? We need public awareness of these issues. As Tracy mentioned, um, our communities are, are at threat, not only the communities in Wiley and Bradford County, not only the communities in Gibbstown and along the Delaware, but all of the communities along those truck and trail uh, rail line uh, routes that we've seen. Um, notice and comment. We want people to be aware of what's going on and then we want you to be engaged. Please comment. Like Tracy said, this is a week of engagement. Call the governor. Tell them not to approve the docket. If we can hold up one permit or many permits, then this project cannot go through. And so um, you can reach out to, sorry, you can reach out to any of these groups. Um, there are others that we're working with as well. Um, but um, at this point, I know we are basically out of time, so I'll turn it over to Sarah for question and answer. Thank you. Thank you, Abby and Diana and Tracy and Kelsey for that wonderful webinar. I know that was a lot of information to process all at once. We will be sending out a recording of the webinar as well as the slideshow. Uh, to everyone who registered. So fear not if you weren't able to take notes fast enough. And uh, we will also be sending out a link to um, the week of action, as well as a link to send a letter to Governor Wolf, or um, if you would so choose, which we hope you do. Um, so with that being said, uh, Kelsey, if there are any um, questions from the chat window, we can open the floor up to any questions to any of the presenters. Yes, um, there's one question um, that we have through our chat, and it is coming from Brian, and Brian's wondering about the ordinances passed by several municipalities in Pennsylvania and New Jersey, and wondering if they're going to be significant enough on their own to thwart the LNG plant in Wyalusing, regardless of whether the Gibbstown facility is approved. Um, would one of the speakers like to answer Brian's question? So I don't know if this answers Brian's question, um, but um, so I know a number of um, municipalities, as Diana pointed out, have passed resolutions kind of opposing um, uh, this kind of um, uh, facility and transport. Um, the problem is that, um, and Diana, you can correct me on anything, but the problem is that um, the county, the, the municipality of Wyalusing has gone ahead and they have gone through their municipal ordinance review and upgrade and they have given, unfortunately, um, the owner operator of the Wyalusing facility, basically the approvals at the municipal level that they needed to start constructing and building at this site. Um, so, if the question is, can the municipality stop the Wyalusing facility? Um, not at this current time, based on what they're doing, but that doesn't mean that we can't explore options to, um, to to see what we can do there. But I will let Diana and Tracy weigh in as well. Yeah, okay, I'll go next on that. Um, we checked with PennDOT to see whether a municipality could ask PennDOT to, you know, put up a no, you know, truck zone or no hazmat zone and and they they can't do that i mean it, if um the the trucks um, carrying the hazmat um they have to register uh with pimsa but then they don't have to tell anybody what route they're going to take and when they're going to take it uh pendot can't restrict um put like a no trucking sign until after there's an accident or you know some disaster so uh, again, so, you know, like people have to be sacrificed before 
uh, any kind of a, um, a regulation like that would be put up. And then the railroad, um, that's federally controlled. Um, not even the state of Pennsylvania can control railroads. Um, so um, the, but the municipal uh, resolution campaign was very important because uh, municipalities as being the smallest form of government to which uh, citizens can bring their concerns, um, they um, can, um, through the, the form of a non-binding resolution, um, express um, a, 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 a need or a problem to higher levels of government that they are expecting to support them as they um, support, you know, the safety of, of their residents. That's, that's one of the fundamental um, uh, roles of municipal governments is um, safety of their residents. Let's see if Tracy wants to add. Yeah, absolutely. You, you've got it there, Diana. Um, one thing I'd like to say that's different about this resolution, you know, resolutions are not ordinances, they're not laws, they're simply advisory. And But this resolution um, was written, the ones that are being passed by uh, the municipalities in Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and Delaware, was written with the now therefore, or the point of the resolution, um, telling the Delaware River Basin commissioners to vote no, and particularly saying to Governor Wolf, who sits mm -hmm. on the Delaware River Basin Commission and has a vote, to vote no. So it's a very specific, directed, targeted resolution with a, a power to it that you don't normally get out of a resolution. And you know, once the project is over, other resolutions could be written with other um, you know, aims, but the aim of these resolutions are specifically a kind of a, a rare opportunity of having a municipality who doesn't have jurisdiction, but who has the, the importance, as Diana said, of representing their constituents, their people and residents uh, and businesses in their town to the Delaware River Basin Commission and actually affecting that vote. So that's the beauty of the resolution campaign. And if they do not act at this meeting and it continues on, our resolution campaign will go on. There's a huge cadre of dedicated citizens um, that are moving forward with this in order to wake up people, but also to, to make this very pointed um, you know, uh, resolution at the Delaware River Basin Commission. I hope that answered your question, Brian. Um, Kelsey, do we have any other questions in the chat? We do not. All right. Um, if anyone else has any other questions, uh, we are just at about time, but feel free to email myself or any of the other speakers today, and we will make sure that those questions get answered. Um, thank you once again to all of our speakers today. Uh, it was very informative and look forward to the copy of the webinar coming your way soon. Thank you all. Thanks so much. Bye.